What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. So it's been a while since we've done a character explanation. Uh, I really kind of miss the idea of doing uh, character explanations, team explanations, but the new mutants are, are a really cool concept in the realm of Marvel because uh, they really come out as a byproduct of the X-Men's popularity, which we'll talk about here in a second. But the new mutants originally appeared in Marvel graphic novel number four, and they were created by Chris Claremont. Now the whole idea is that this was done in 1982, and this comes hot off the heels of the X-Men's popularity. Remember, back when the X-Men were first created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby when Marvel was launching all these publications in the early 1960s, the Fantastic Four, Thor, Iron Man, Ant-Man, the Avengers, the return of Captain America, Spider-Man, different things like that, a lot of the comic book readers that were coming to Marvel were already at DC because a lot of the comic book publishers that existed, they were trying to publish superheroes, had largely faded out by the time World War II came to an end. So from the mid 1940s going all the way up into the early 1960s, if you were reading comics, you were largely reading DC. And so Marvel found its foothold in creating characters and concepts that DC hadn't done before. The problem with the X-Men was that when they originally popped up, they were teenage kids with superpowers. And while the superpower element was new with regards to new, you know, teenage superheroes, for the most part, DC had covered a lot of that stuff. They had basically launched the Teen Titans. And so when the X-Men ran up until about issue number 63, I think it was, Marvel basically stopped printing new stories and just ran reprints until issue number 94. Now in issue number 95, Chris Claremont took over the title after the relaunch of X-Men with Giant Size X-Men issue number one. And because he focused on the team as more of a uh, soap opera, because he focused more on characters as opposed to adventurous and zany stories like Stan Lee did, the X-Men actually became Marvel's highest selling publication. And so because of that, seven years after their, I guess after this relaunch by Claremont, uh, the editor in chief at, at the time, Jim Shooter, basically wanted to launch another X-Men title, something that would basically build on the success of the X-Men itself, but have a wholly different roster. And so what Chris Claremont did is he formed the New Mutants as a throwback to the original X-Men stories that focused largely on the idea of teenage kids who had developed superpowers and were, were basically trying to figure themselves out in the process. Now, the only caveat to this is a character named Karma, a character named uh, Jeanne Koi Man, I think is how you pronounce it. I think that's her name, but she had originally appeared in Marvel Team Up issue number 100 two years before. So she'd been around for a couple of years before Chris Claremont rolled her into the new mutants but because of her experience and the fact that she'd been around for a while she became the de facto leader but the long and short of their whole uh of their whole origin is that much like the original x-men and much like mutants in general their powers largely manifested in response to a kind of uh stress of sorts with regards to the character wolfsbane also known as rain sinclair she can literally turn herself into a werewolf she had previously occupied a place referred to as muir island which was uh, basically the base of operations the home more or less of of Maura McTaggart, who had long since been a standing friend of the X-Men, kind of this mutant geneticist, this researcher who was the scientific arm of the X-Men team alongside the, you know, beast Hank McCoy. Now, of course, Wolfbane gaining her abilities, simply just kind of popping up, comes as a byproduct of mutants at the time, in the sense that there was a lot of hatred for mutants because humanity either didn't like them because they were so powerful or they didn't understand them. Different philosophical viewpoints went into that, but Rain Sinclair kind of stumbled across the path of Maura McTaggart, and she ultimately ended up uh, basically taking reign over to Charles Xavier. Now, the same thing happened with Robert da Costa, a young kid based out of Brazil, who basically manifested the ability to absorb solar energy and turn it into a physical strength. Cannonball Sam Guthrie from Kentucky, much the same way, absorbs uh, solar energy, kind of able, is able to put off this thermal energy that allows him to fly. Uh, but this is how these characters began manifesting their abilities. It has sort of popped up. Now, one of the big exceptions to this is Danielle Moonstar. When we end up seeing her, her powers have already popped up and she basically has the ability to create these sort of empathic uh, illusions, to essentially get people to see things that reflect her emotional state. But the idea is that they were all essentially being targeted by a guy named Donald Pierce. Now, Donald Pierce in the movies is just a guy who works in this part of the project with regards to X-23. There wasn't a whole lot going on to his character in the Logan film. In the comics, he's vastly different. He is basically a member of a group called the Hellfire Club. Now, the Hellfire Club had been around Marvel for quite some time. They were basically one of the various villain groups 
Apocalypse, who had been introduced in the X-Men stories under Chris Claremont in an effort to basically bolster the various enemies for the X-Men to face off against. But for Donald Pierce himself, unlike the other members of the Hellfire Club who possess various powers, Donald does not have any abilities of his own. Instead, he's basically a cyborg of sorts. But the idea was that Donald Pierce was essentially a fanatic who hated mutants. And for the longest time, the Hellfire Club was basically this sort of inner circle of individuals who had the ability to influence the world through money and different things like that. The problem with this was that there was a point along the line when the Hellfire Club was co-opted by mutants. They essentially took over the ranks of the Hellfire Club. Donald Pierce hated this concept. And so the goal was to take the new mutants, use them for his own cause to basically take over the Hellfire Club and then get rid of the new mutants so there wouldn't really be any challenge to his cause. The other half of this was the ongoing stories of the X-Men at the time in the sense that the X-Men were experiencing this wax and wane under the writing of Chris Claremont. Specifically, there were a handful of things that had taken place. Uh, the X-Men were basically off in space fighting the brood. They were believed to have been dead. Jean Grey had already sacrificed herself during the events of the Phoenix Saga. She was believed to have been dead. These kind of things hit Charles Xavier in a way where he basically felt like he was a failure as a leader, as a father figure, as a teacher. And so he ultimately didn't want to teach the new mutants. But Moore McTaggart effectively persuaded him to, his, to this cause. And the result was that he ended up taking up arms, teaching the new mutants as a new generation of heroes who could in turn develop their own fan base and their own core group of readers. The other half of this is that with the conclusion of the, the origin story for New Mutants, the defeat of Donald Pierce and so on and so forth, the idea of Marvel was to look at the success of New Mutants in terms of the actual origin, to gauge audience reception by way of letters, pages, sales, different things like that, and then decide whether or not they were actually going to get a publication, which they did in March of 1983 with New Mutants Volume 1, Issue Number 1. Now, again, with Chris Claremont continuing the story, over the course of the first seven or so issues, there was a little bit of reshuffling in the sense that Claremont was really just kind of teasing the waters to see how people would respond to different scenarios, explicitly with the death of Karma. Now, the idea was that she did not really die per se. She was essentially possessed by the Shadow King. She eventually was used by the Shadow King to go on and become a gangster, but it allowed Danny Moonstar and Cannonball to take over a leadership role in the team. Now, again, going on after the first seven issues or so, over the course of the next seven, usually, you know, between issues eight and 14, there were some things that were sort of being juggled around and some actions that were being taken by Claremont in an effort to continue bolstering up the readership. As a really good example, we actually ended up seeing them come into contact with the Hellfire Club, but instead of seeing them battle the Hellfire Club, instead, Chris Claremont created a younger version of the Hellfire Club, which are referred to as the Hellions. Now, this was huge for a lot of comic book readers at the time, because while Charles Xavier believed the X-Men were dead, individuals who were reading Uncanny X-Men knew they weren't. And so what it did is it gave fans the best of both worlds. Because of that, some new changes were made to the publications over the course of issues 8 to 14. We saw the introduction of characters like Cypher, who was basically a guy that could understand any language, whether it was written or spoken. The character of Magic, Ileana Rasputin, which incidentally, as the sister of Colossus, is her first major comic book introduction in terms of anything past her origin in Giant Size X-Men number one. We saw all these things going on with these characters, these new roles being introduced, these characters being, uh, being allowed to stand on their own two feet, and fans were very much receptive to it because Claremont focused just as much on the storytelling of the individual characters as he did with the team itself. At the same time, when it came to comic book publications under Marvel, for the most part, the only real science fiction thing that you saw was usually whatever stories involved the Fantastic Four who may have been exploring other parts of space or Doctor Strange. And so when New Mutants came along and they were basically blending in science fiction and fantasy, it was a great throwback to the 1950s to an era of comics that a lot of readers were nostalgic for but hadn't actually actually lived in. People loved New Mutants. Now, at the same time, Chris Claremont was also focusing on things like sort of this redeeming story of Magneto in the sense that with Uncanny X-Men issue number 200, the trial of Magneto, that Charles Xavier had essentially been taken away by the Shi'ar Empire, a spacefaring race that had already been established in the X-Men series at the time. And then Magneto himself took over leadership of the X-Men. Now, the problem with this was that in a lot of ways, existing members of the X-Men had basically left, but the benefit 
benefit to New Mutants fans was that they were basically teenagers doing what teenagers did. Where Magneto laid down rules, Magneto said here's what you can and can't do, the New Mutants would feature stories where they would basically break out, escape the school, they would go on adventures, they would save their friends from all these different threats, and a lot of teenage readers could live vicariously through them. The problem with this was that because New Mutants proved itself to be so wildly popular among readers, because of the fact that uh, the X-Men itself was still wildly popular at the time, and Chris Claremont was the de facto X-Men guy, Marvel began tasking him with the role of launching new titles, new publications, and so ultimately Wolverine was a standout star of the Uncanny X-Men line, and so he ended up getting his own solo series under Chris Claremont, as well as the introduction of Excalibur, the British superhero team. And so as a result, Claremont actually took a break from New Mutants with the intention of coming back, and the line was handed over to Louise Simonson. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this coincides with the return of Jean Grey, which is to say, because Jean Grey had basically died as the Phoenix, and because she was so incredibly popular in both the Phoenix and Dark Phoenix sagas, fans wanted to see her make her return. But Jean Grey, alongside Cyclops, Angel, Beast, and Iceman, had broken off from the original X-Men team and focused on basically a team of their own titled X-Factor. And so with New Mutants, serving as a younger, more vibrant companion to both Uncanny X-Men and the X-Factor line, the roster was bolstered even more. And so things began to grow at an almost rapid pace. I mean, we saw things like Rusty Collins, Richter skits. We saw these characters being brought in and being rolled over into the landscape and things beginning to basically, you know, shuffle and grow and increase even more. Now, depending on who you talk to, there is basically this idea that Louise Simonson was essentially making Marvel unhappy in terms of her writing. Marvel, because of the events of the death of Gwen Stacy in 1971, the idea of the Dark Knight Returns, Marvel ended up moving in this direction of crafting stories that were darker, that were more gritty. Over on uh, over under Mary Jo Duffy, with regards to Power Man and Iron Fist, for example, she was writing comedic stories, which Marvel didn't like. So they fired her, they replaced her with Kurt Busiek, he did the same thing, they fired him. Then they brought in uh, Christopher Priest, who killed off Iron Fist, and then basically ended the publication with issue number 125. Louise Simonson that had come along and basically said it seems to be the exact same thing that's going on with regards to the New Mutants line. And so because of that, she ultimately gave up with issue number 97. And the result is that when she walked away, Rob Liefeld and Fabian Nassiza were brought in and they essentially relaunched the entirety of the uh, of the New Mutants line. Now, this only lasted for about, about three issues, about three or four issues, issues 97 through 100. And the idea was to basically finish out the New Mutants line and then cancel the title as it existed and relaunch it as something else. But under Liefeld and under Nasiza, because of the fact that the early 1990s saw this huge paradigm shift in comics, in the sense that things were becoming high octane, things were becoming extremely fast paced, and things were really moving in the direction of being like this, you know, super futuristic, which is one of the reasons why you see a lot of characters from Marvel Comics in the early 1990s wearing headpieces and having a lot of gear that makes them look impossibly large and things like that. But with Louise Simonson leaving in issue number seven and Rob Liefeld and Fabian Nasiza taking taking over, a lot of the existing plot lines that she had going were effectively abandoned with, you know, Rob Liefeld and Nasiza picking up the slack. And so where the futuristic son of Madeline Pryor and Cyclops Cable had actually appeared in New Mutants number 87 in March of 1990, while he was created by Louise Simonson, the plot threads that she had going in terms of the overall arc that she wanted to do with him were effectively abandoned. So where he had initially just sort of shown up as this guy from the future that nobody really knew anything about, under Liefeld and Nasiza, everything was effectively reworked. And so the original New Mutants roster, or at least as it had evolved with regards to Boom Boom, Rusty Collins, you know, Richter Skids, those guys, it eventually went away. And instead, they were replaced by uh, by Domino, Feral, Shatterstar, and Warpath. Now, of course, this goes into like the origin of Deadpool, the fact that the version of Domino that we saw was not actually Domino. Instead, it was a character named Copycat who was impersonating Domino. These are the kind of things that eventually went on in those stories. But the problem with this was that with issue number 100, canceling New Mutants and the stories being relaunched. While the stories were initially extremely popular, the problem with this was that the value of New Mutants began to go away. Because of the fact that X-Men Volume 2 issue number one continued to be one of the highest selling comic books of all time because Uncanny X-Men saw Chris Claremont leaving within the first 10 issues, I think it was, Jim Lee leaving shortly after, we ended up seeing all these things coalescing to the point where Marvel was running headlong into the mid-1990s comic bust with a lot of their stories losing their value. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the, the 1990s comic bus was basically a byproduct of the fact that people believed the value of comics would rise forever. And so they just went out and bought a whole 
bunch of comics thinking that they would just hold value for years and years and years and years. The result is that comic book publishers began flooding the market with comics, believing that they were just ever more popular when in reality, fans were artificially inflating the market. Now DC, Valiant Comics, all these companies were affected by the mid 90s comic bust, but DC was backed by Warner Brothers. Marvel was not, which meant that if their stories ultimately went under, they would have shut their doors or they would have had to sell out to somebody. But back during this point in time, because the sci-fi escapades, the alternate realities, all these science fiction elements had basically gone away in favor of a series of stories that just dealt with super high action, high octane events ultimately meant that X-Force began to kind of go away. Running into 2002, it remained relatively popular. The problem with this was that things began to drop off. And so ultimately Marvel had to begin going through and start making concessions as to what comic books were going to last the longest to ultimately become successful. And so beginning in 2003 under Nunzio De Phillips, I think is how you pronounce his name. I believe that's who it was. New Mutants was basically relaunched and the idea was to keep X-Force going, but to focus on the concept of New Mutants as basically this new modern era of characters who would basically begin going through and, and running through their own stories. The funny thing about this though, was that it was not initially launched on its own. Instead, what ended up happening is that with Grant Morrison being brought in by Marvel Comics after his run on JLA in 1998, as well as things like, you know, Doom Patrol and so on at DC comics, he was tasked with relaunching the X-Men in 2001. And so writing the stories as new X-Men and the uh, Academy X number two spinoff, the new mutants were basically reintroduced as volume two. And so ultimately, again, under the uh, under uh, Nunzio, we ended up seeing everything sort of brought back. We saw new characters being introduced, existing characters coming back. So the roster grew to include people like Elixir, this Omega level mutant that can basically uh, heal anybody from any kind of harm they might sustain. We saw all these things being brought in. The problem with this was that seeing a younger generation of superheroes was not new. The stories had to be done in a way that drew people in. The problem is that these stories as they were written didn't really do a whole lot to keep the readership there. And so ultimately it ended up lasting around 13 issues up until 2004 when Marvel launched House of M. Now the idea of House of M was to basically look around under the, you know, the editor-in-chief leadership of Joe Quesada to look around and, and simply say the X-Men landscape has grown too large and too unruly. There's too many mutants out there and it takes away from the ability to tell compelling stories. Marvel came back and just reduced the mutant population by a huge amount, essentially saying that of the 100 and however many students there were at the Xavier Institute, only like 20 something actually kept their powers. And so what this did is it allowed Marvel to focus back down on the, uh, on the new mutants landscape as it existed, you know, after the events of House of M and tell more compelling stories. Now in truth, the new mutants for the most part vanished after that. What Marvel ended up doing is they came back in 2009 and they effectively relaunched it under Zeb Wells. It was really just kind of going back to the core roster, to really the most popular roster as it existed by combining the first two groups of the New Mutants. So we basically ended up getting Cannonball, Karma, Magma, Danny Moonstar, and Sunspot coming together to help reform the team. This really just kind of existed alongside the events of like X-Furnace, you know, so on and so forth, these stories, the idea that the X-Men had basically left the United States, taken up residence in Utopia off the coast of San Francisco. And so again, the idea was to bolster the stories, to keep them tied into existing things, and then in turn, keep the New Mutants title popular among readers. Again, the issue here is that we ended up seeing the New Mutants line begin to lose popularity yet again when we started seeing events like Second Coming and the new generation of mutants who were brought in after New Mutants called Generation Hope under Hope Summers, the first mutant born after the events of House of M. And so because the late 1990s going into the 2000s and the 2010s was it's basically just this giant hotbed, this huge mess when it came to like all these different X related titles. Ultimately, the value of the uh, of the New Mutants line again began to fade because the characters just weren't really compelling anymore. At the end of the day, it just never really seemed to serve a unique purpose. And so ultimately, Marvel's last attempt to really revisit the New Mutants line came during the events of X-Men Schism. And this was a story that basically dealt with the idea that Wolverine and Cyclops had two distinctly different ideologies in terms of how the X-Men should be led. And so ultimately they had this feud of sorts, they ended up splitting. That led into a story called Regenesis, which basically gave us the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning under the leadership of Wolverine, and then Utopia under the leadership of Cyclops. And for the most part, the younger mutants who were being trained by Wolverine, we saw some of them stay with him, we saw others staying with uh, with Cyclops. And so the new mutants didn't really exist anymore. They were just kind of, you know, younger mutants who were being trained by both sides, both of whom had completely different ideologies. But again, 
again, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw this out there, throw a little bit of tidbits of information out there for you guys with regards to the new mutants landscape. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, kind of a lot to throw at you guys. <laughs> But there is a lot of interesting history there. So it's kind of weird getting back on the horse and doing character explanations again. But with that being said, guys, uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. And I will catch you all later. Peace.